so uh, hello everyone good evening and uh, today we'll be starting with our new series that is uh, neuropharmacology series and we'll be starting with a very important anti parkinson's drug that is ropinirone so every week we'll be discussing one drug from neurology and uh, so we'll start with the first one so with regard to ropinirone its mechanism of action as most of you know is it is a dopamine agonist okay and in specific it is a non ergot dopamine agonist and it exerts its action predominantly on the D2, D3 as well as D4 receptors and its main anti-Parkinson's action is because of the action on the D2 receptors. So it exerts its anti-Parkinson's action by acting on the D2 receptors and here it predominantly acts on the triatum which involves the caudate and pitamine. So the caudate and pitamine together form this triatum and uh, by acting on the D2 receptors on this triatum it exerts its anti-Parkinson's action. So now why do we use okay or where do we use ropinirole? So there are two important approved indications for ropinirole. The first one is very important that is Parkinson's disease and the second one is restless leg syndrome. So for Parkinson's disease, so where do we use it? Okay, so number one we have a young patient with Parkinson's disease who has motor symptoms which is not significantly affecting the day-to-day -day activities. So if you have a patient who is a young case of Parkinson's with motor symptoms which is not significantly uh, affecting the day-to-day -day activities. So in this case it can be used as an initial monotherapy. So why do we prefer to use a dopamine agonist as an initial monotherapy in patients with young cases of Parkinson's is because in these patients we are going to start them on levodopa initially uh, even with mild motor symptoms the uh, onset of motor fluctuations and dyskinesias that is associated with levodopa comes much earlier. So it's important, it's wise that we actually start it as a, a usually dopamine agonist as a monotherapy before going on to add levodopa. So yes, it is used initially in monotherapy, especially in young patients with PD who are having motor symptoms which are not very significantly disabling. And number two, in Parkinson's disease per se, it can be used as an adjunct therapy with levodopa. And the advantage of dopamine agonist along with uh, with comparison to levodopa is, so there is no debate, it is not as efficacious as well as levodopa. Levodopa is way more, uh, uh, way more stronger uh, anti-Parkinson's drug. But the advantages of ropinirole and other dopamine agonist is because of their longer uh, action on the dopamine uh, receptors, there is less incidence of motor fluctuations. There is less in incidence of motor fluctuations. And there is also less dyskinesia, less risk for dyskinesia. So these two are actually more in case of, are more in case of levodopa. So that's a problem with levodopa. So even though it is more, uh, uh, it's more stronger anti-Parkinson's drug, uh, inherently the motor dyskinesias as well as uh, motor fluctuations are more with that. And this is an advantage while well using dopamine agonists. And number two, it is used in restless leg syndrome. And again, compared to levodopa, the augmentation phenomenon and rebound phenomenon is less with dopamine agonist in comparison to levodopa. And coming to the dosing, so this is very important. While in Parkinson's disease, we usually we start at around uh, 3 milligrams per day. This can go all the way up to 24 or even sometimes 27 milligrams per day. Whereas in restless leg syndrome, the dosage is much more less and the maximum dose is usually less than 4 milligrams okay it is less than 4 milligrams per day or any or any dose which is lower than this where you get the desired action and we have two formulations of rope roll one is the immediate release formulation and one is the extended release formulation and we get the immediate release formulation in multiples of 0.25 so we have 0.25 mg 0.5 mg and after that we have formulations at 1 2 3 4 and 5 milligrams and the extended release comes in multiples of 2 so we have 2 milligrams 4 milligrams and 8 milligrams while both the immediate release and the extended release are used for Parkinson's disease, remember that the extended release formulation is not approved for restless leg syndrome. So for restless leg syndrome, it is only uh, immediate release formulation which is approved. Whereas for Parkinson's disease, both the uh, immediate release as well as the extended release is approved. So how do we titrate the dose for Parkinson's disease? So whether it be Parkinson's disease or uh, restless leg syndrome, remember, the key while adding dopamine agonists is we have to slowly update the dose, update the dose. So if you do not up slowly update rate, all the dopamine agonist related side effects like postural hypertension, uh, giddiness, nausea and vomiting would be significantly uh, disabling. So it's it's uh, vital that we start at a low dose, slowly increase till we, uh, till we reach the desired clinical effect or the maximum dosage. So with regard to Parkinson's disease, when coming to the immediate release 
formulation of ropinirole. So initially we have to start at a dose of 0.25 milligrams orally three times per day. And then what happens is every week we have to increase the dose by 0.25 milligrams. Okay, so 0.25 milligrams per week we have to we have to increase the dose. After which we reach a target dose of around 1 to 2 or 1 to 3 milligram three times per day. Okay, so even though you have 1 milligram to 3 milligrams three times per day. And you achieve these dose over the next two to three weeks. And further increases after this should be done at 0.5 milligram per week till we reach 9 milligram per day. Okay, but remember that the actual maximum dose we can go is up to 24 to 27 milligrams per day. Okay, to summarize, start at 0.25 milligram TDS, slowly increase by 0.25 milligrams every week till we reach around 1 to 2 to 3, 2, 3 milligrams three times per day. And a further increases at 0 0.5, 0 0.5 milligram per week till we reach 9 milligram per day. And if the still the desired clinical effect is not reached, we can increase this to a maximum dose of 24 to 27 milligrams per day. But remember, this maximum dosage is only for Parkinson's disease. And coming to the extended release, so the advantage of extended release is you just have to give it OD, okay? So once a day dosing is more than enough for extended release. Whereas if you take the immediate release, you have to give it three times a day. So the advantage of extended release is you only one time a day dosing. And initially we started two milligrams per day. And over the next one to uh, one to two weeks, we increase it by two milligram per, uh, two milligram per week till you reach the uh, desired clinical effect or a maximum dose of 24 milligram per day. So remember, advantage of extended release is the once in, a, uh, once in a day dosing, but the maximum dosage is more or less the same. Now coming to uh, restless leg syndrome. So for restless leg syndrome, uh, the maximum dose, remember, is 4 milligrams. Okay, it's 4 milligrams per day. And another thing you should remember is the extended release formulation is not approved for restless leg syndrome. It is only the immediate release formulation which is approved okay here the starting doses is much much less we usually we started 0 0.25, uh, 0.25 milligrams per day od and then we increase this 0.25 to 0 0.5 milligrams over the next two to three days and further increases you have to increase it to one milligram after one week and after this you have to increase by 0.5 milligram per week till we reach the maximum dose of four milligrams or if the desired clinical effect is reached and another important thing with regard to restless leg syndrome is the dose timing so as you know, restless leg syndrome is a movement disorder that predominantly happens when the legs are not doing any sort of activity. So this is obviously seen at the times of sleep. So usually the patient will go to sleep, then they have this uncomfortable sensations of the legs and they need to keep moving it. So it is vital that we give the medication one to three hours before bedtime. Okay, so timing is very, very important for restless leg syndrome. So to summarize, start at 0.25 milligrams per day. Increase this to 0.5 milligrams per day over the next two to three days. And the next week, you make this 0.5 into one milligram OD. And further increases by 0.5 milligram per week till we reach the desired clinical effect or a maximum dose of four milligrams. Again, emphasizing the extended release formulation of ropinirole is not approved for restless leg syndrome. It is only approved for Parkinson's disease. All right. Now, coming to the adverse drug reactions. Okay, so this is... Uh, not only for ropinirole, this is uh, this is true for all dopamine agonists like pramipexole and uh, all the other ergot alkaloids also. So most important is nausea and vomiting, syncope and giddiness. Okay, this is because of action of the dopamine receptor, and after that, uh, neuropsychiatric uh, complications like hallucinations, cognitive decline in the chronic use, and constipation and fetal edema is also important. Somnolescence, okay, please, you have to warn patients who commonly drive, especially heavy vehicle drivers, uh, dopamine agonists, not only ropinirole, even pramipexol can cause sudden sleep attacks, okay, the patient can suddenly fall asleep while driving, so it's important to warn the patients to not drive if they are sleep deprived, and to warn them the fact that they are, they are at high risk of falling asleep, and this is, uh, uh, you have to especially uh, mention this in caution to patients who are heavy vehicle drivers, so sudden sleep attacks and increased somnolescence, should be warned in patients who are frequent drivers. Orthostatic hypertension, dyskinesias, yes, but not as common as in levodopa, and very small risk of cardiac arrhythmias, and these are predominantly bradyarrhythmias. And chronic dopamine agonist use can cause impulse control disorders, okay? So this can take the form of gambling, very high financial risk-taking behavior, hypersexuality, compulsive eating, as well as shopping. And along with impulse control disorders, very commonly seen is the dopamine dysregulation syndrome. So this is a sort of dopamine, uh, uh, dopaminergic drug sort of addiction. This can happen with levodopa also and other dopamine agonists. So basically what happens is 
the patient frequently takes the dopaminergic medications much more than what is needed to actually control the patient's motor symptoms. So this is sort of addiction to dopamine agents and this is known as dopamine dysregulation syndrome commonly occurs along with impulse control disorders and as I mentioned earlier in acute phase how dopamine agonists can cause hallucinations, chronic use and co can cause some degree of cognitive impairment. Now coming to the pharmacokinetics and interactions and uh, ropinirole does not have a significant renal metabolism it's primarily metabolized by the liver and very important enzyme is cytochrome 1A2. Okay, this is very important because of the drug interactions which we'll come to and the T half is 6 hours so longer than liver dopa and also it acts on the dopamine receptor much longer so because of this long duration of action of uh, ropinirole there is less risk of dyskinesias as mentioned earlier and decreased risk of motor fluctuations whereas these are more common in liver dopa because of its shorter, uh, uh, shorter duration of action. So coming to see uh, cytochrome 1A2 inhibitors, okay, so your common enzyme inhibitors like ciprofloxacin, simetidine, diltiazem, erythromycin and nexalitin. So they inhibit the metabolism of uh, uh, ropinirole and can cause uh, increased uh, dosage or toxicity. And commonly we prescribe omeprazole for no reason for most patients. You can see many prescriptions have proton pump inhibitors of which commonly omeprazole is given. So this is a uh, uh, this you should know because it can actually induce the cytochrome 1A2 uh, uh, enzyme and this can decrease the levels of ropinirole. So please before uh, prescribing uh, omeprazole uh, generically for all your patients, uh, please note that for your Parkinson's patient, omeprazole can induce this enzyme and can decrease the levels and decrease and decrease the efficacy of ropinirole in these patients. And yes, smoking too, chronic smoking also. And also it has a synergistic effect with levodopa, so that's why it is used as an adjunct therapy. It is used in an adjunct therapy along with levodopa and in young PD patients with not very significant motor impairment, it can be used as monotherapy. And please use in caution in your hypertensive patients because it can reduce the BP. Okay, So dopamine agonist by itself can reduce the BP and in patients who are on multiple antihypertensive medications, uh, please use it with caution. Now coming to dose adjustment as we had discussed earlier. It is significantly uh, metabolized only in the liver. Okay, so there is a not significant dose adjustments in patients with renal impairment, but however, in patients with severe, okay, not mild to moderate, but with severe hepatic uh, impairment, please use it with caution. And as mentioned earlier, dopamine agonists can cause bradyarrhythmias. Okay, they can cause bradycardia and bradyarrhythmias. So please use in caution with patients who are already at a risk of uh, cardiac arrhythmias. Pregnancy category is C. So unless the risk benefit ratio warrants so. It is uh, best avoided in pregnancy. With regard to breastfeeding, it's not that it's not safe in breastfeeding, but however, it can actually reduce prolactin, uh, prolactin secretion. Why? Because it is a dopamine agonist. Okay, so all dopamine agonists will act on the pituitary to decrease prolactin secretion, so it can decrease the amount of breast milk that is produced. Okay, so uh, this is about ropinirole, and uh, so those who next week will be discussing a new drug, and uh, till then, bye.